just before I broke my foot. Okay. Hello everyone. Um, today I have the honor of introducing Ines Fung. Um, my name is Gina Kwan and I'm one of the co-coordinators in the Compass Lecture Series. Ines Fung's passion for science began as a young girl in Hong Kong. Throughout secondary school, she was one of the few girls in the prestigious math and science preparatory class at King's College. Fung initially had plans to study at the University of Hong Kong in the late 60s. However, due to political unrest in China, her parents moved their families to America. This change of plans led Ines to, set, to spend her first year at Utica College in New York, but she soon found it too easy. MIT proved to be more her speed. She later graduated with a degree in applied mathematics and a PhD in meteorology. Ines, now a professor of EPS and SBOM, has since built a career on climate modeling. She serves as co-director of the Berkeley Institute of the Environment. Despite having a slew of awards and accomplishments, including a contribution to the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize for the International Panel for Climate Change, these titles mean little to an end. She instead studies science for the purpose of learning and scientific reward. Fong also enjoys cooking, as cooking is often like a science. A single recipe, she says, takes several tries to get just right. For this reason, she admires Julia Childs for her thorough scientific approach. Her hollandaise sauce recipe, for example, <laughs>
So this wind, so this is tank line continuity. We're pushing water away from the coast, and so there is cold water being brought up. Okay, so if you think about this as 18 or 20 degrees Celsius isotherm, then this is this is still warm, okay, but it's cooler on this side than it is on that side. Okay, sea surface temperature here is about 22, and sea surface temperature here is 20. Yes. Is that what's referred to as upwelling? Yes, this is upwelling. So this is this is upwelling. Okay, just continuity. So I'm sort of sitting right now at the equator, so I am not concerned yet about Coriolis. Okay, later Coriolis would come in, but I'm right on the equator. Yes. And then why, why is the wind going that direction? This is just, hmm? why does the wind go that way? Okay, so we go to the large scale circulation. It's because this is the earth spinning? And there's... Yeah. Really? Well, if instead of going east-west, now I go north-south, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm at the equator and the pole is over there, right? So it's warm, right? So it would go and sink and typically 30 degrees, okay? Wow. So then there's a return flow coming back at the surface, okay? Now if I'm in the northern hemisphere, right, so okay, now that's the Coriolis now, okay, this is coming south, Coriolis would turn it that way and go eastward, okay? In the southern hemisphere, the same thing, there would be rising motion, there would be sinking motion, so the flow would be towards the equator, the surface flow and then <coughs> would be to the yeah. okay. okay, so we have the wind would be from the east to the west, easterly winds. Okay? So this is a normal situation and this is called we call the Walker circulation after Sir Gilbert Walker, who was the director general uh, of the Indian Meteorological Service. So the so the to understand why there were periods of drought in India. Because he didn't really figure out what, why there was a, a drought in India, in India, but he figured that between Tahiti, which is here, and Darwin, Australia, there is a pressure difference. Okay? The pressure, obviously, the wind is going from here, the pressure is higher <coughs> on this side than on that side. Okay, this is a pressure gradient, sometimes it's weaker, sometimes it's strong. It's always going, the wind is always going this way, but sometimes the wind is weaker, and sometimes the wind is stronger, when you have depending on the pressure gradient. Okay? So that was Sir Gilbert Walker. What happened was that the Peruvians here, okay, also found that this is you have adiabatic compression. Okay, so this is dry, there's a desert here, right? This air going from low pressure to high pressure, okay, the adiabatic compression. So the, so this is, there's a desert, but sometimes, okay? And the Peruvians found out in the late 1800s, and they reported that there were certain times in December uh, that the currents were warm, Okay, and there were rains. Okay, so the desert, were, there would be flowers, and the warm currents would come in and bring coconuts and snakes and stuff. So they call it El Nino. Okay, <laughs> and rice cloud. Okay, that came that something had happened, and they brought coconuts, warm and good conditions. So what we know now is that when we have El Nino conditions, when the coconuts came to the roof that the warm water here is now shifted to the center. Okay, what we know is that the winds weakened, okay, so there's a, still the pressure gradient, but it's now weaker. So the winds are weaker. When the winds are weaker, remember what happened. You know, what I said about the sea level, the sea level, okay? When the winds were strong, it was like this. Now when the wind weakens, there's going to be sloshing, okay? So this, the wave that goes over there is the Calvin wave. Okay, so I have a whole family, they know this person, the Calvin waves hit the coast, and then they would reflect back as a family of waves. Okay, you get the idea that the sea level relaxes, and so the, the waves would go this way, and then they would go back. As the waves go, and it takes many months to, to slosh, but, the, but the, the warm water goes to the center, Okay, moves from, the, from Indonesia to the center, 
of the equatorial Pacific. So the rains move from Indonesia, this is when Australia has fires and then tremendous droughts in Southeast Asia. The rains move here, and so then you have the convection in the middle of the Pacific, and so there is convection in this. Okay? So while this is happening, you can see underneath the thermocline is a climb, is a place of breaking. Okay, so this is where the so this is where the warm water pushes this down. Okay, so you can see this underneath the condition. You see the you see the you get the picture of the wind weakening, and so then this comes over here. Okay, and the end of the cycle is that now I have increased convection, and now the wind gets stronger. Okay, you see the wind getting weaker and the convection moves over and the wind gets stronger and then we move back to the original position. Yes? What's the magnitude of the sea level difference? Like the uh, about, I don't know, the off by unit. But a friend of mine, you mentioned, he taught his PhD thesis and went out and measured the sea level <laughs> around all the islands. Of the I'm going to say centimeters, 30 centimeters, but I should check the unit. I may be off. So that should be like noticeable on the coast. Oh yeah, we see that we actually see it in the satellite. So I'm just off. I, I just need to figure out okay. what of magnitude of error not possible. But we, we do see the we do see the and so because he was out there, our friend was out there, you actually see the packet, you know, you can see the packet uh, going by. So it's beautiful measurement. So what I'm gonna talk about is sea surface temperature. First, we'll start with sea surface temperature. Okay. So this is this is La Nina. This is a typical. It doesn't look much different when you look at different. Just look at the total sea surface temperature. What we do is to calculate the anomalies, okay, in sea surface temperature. So we do the mean for the whole for every place we calculate the mean, January mean, February, etc. And we subtract that, and when you look at that, then the, the normal conditions, you know, this is a particular year, 1993, but this there's not much variation, it's still some, but this is a particular year, okay? But when we have La Nina years, there's a cold blue top over here, so the equatorial Pacific is colder, and when we have El Nino, we have warm top over here, okay? So this is a warm water. So El Nino and La Nina are just opposite faces of the same. The opposite faces. And that's a very interesting thing because I started with some Peruvians, you know, coconuts and stuff. So what do you call the cold face? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it started with anti El Nino, and you understand that's a religiously not correct. Okay. <laughs> 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 you we'll call it the girl, the boy, and the girl. Okay. <laughs> and then you call it, and they will start where this is the old, this is the young and the old. And so the different people, we call it, so we call this whole thing the ENSO, or the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and we have a warm face and a cold face of the, of the, of the ENSO. Okay, so, so, so that's why I started saying that you have summer, you know, you have day and night and summer and winter, to me, there is beyond that, you know, on a longer time scale, I always have warm faces and cold faces when they come to me, okay, on, on a longer time scale. So, uh, so this is the index of El Nino, so the El Nino is here. So you can see that the 82, 83 was a big El Nino. This was 98, 98 was a big one. And so we're trying to understand what it is. And so we have the, the couple atmosphere ocean models, and so there you try to start, and there's a random progression, and so you can start, and so then you can look at the, 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 the waves in the, in the ocean, and then we'll go into the atmosphere. Okay, so this is the fairly straightforward. But the crucial thing is that it has to be coupled, so that we needed the convection to move to the center of the Pacific and then strengthen uh, strengthen the uh, wind to fill it off. Okay, that's the, it's a messier thing than that, but that's the, that's the schematic that I want you to have in your head. Um, so what happened recently? So this is the February 2000, this is the uh, February, so you can see the warm water here. 
So this is the anomaly. Okay, so you see this patch. So so we are in we are in the middle of an El Nino. And if I take this chunk, okay, from five north to five south, okay, and then plot it like oops, this is not very this is just a different way of seeing January, February, <coughs> the changes, the population of the equatorial center. This is all from satellite observations. But what I want to show is that this is called a Huff River diagram, but this is the anomaly 5 north to 5 south, and so Indonesia is here, Peru is there. Okay, so I take the, I take, it's like I take this, I take this every month, okay, and I stack them together. When I was a student, I did it by, by bought a butcher's roll of paper, <laughs> and I cut, I cut the <laughs> maps. Okay, I was looking at cloud propagation, and I cut the maps, and I stick them on every month to make this thing. Okay, so now you have to do that. So you can see the time goes this way. Okay, so you can see that in April 2009, this is fairly cool in the middle of the Pacific, it's, it's still warmer than normal over here. But when we get to October 2009, the warm patch is now in the middle of August. There's a warm anomaly here, and the cool anomaly is beginning to show up. Cooler than normal here, okay? So you can see the propagation of the animal, of the warm water. And so what happens when you have a patch of warm water Okay. You're going to change the pressure, right? So basically, you're starting a wave, a propagating wave. Okay, so you can see the beautiful wave train going like this. When we have a, 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 a low pressure, a warm anomaly here, so we have a high pressure, a low pressure, and a high pressure. Okay, you see this, this is the appropriate Rossby wave train. Okay, so for January. So basically, you change the you change the, the jet stream, you change all the you perturb <coughs> all the large scale circulation because the warm water that has moved to the center of the Pacific, that anomaly is heating the atmosphere, so it's not just heating it like this because we're looking at the fluid. But when you put a pep, you throw a pebble into the pond, they are ripples. Right? This is a different kind, this is a large scale planetary scale uh, Ripple, so then you have this, you have a low pressure, high pressure, etc. Okay, so we're, I'm looking mainly at. Um, uh, sorry. Hmm? So do, are these kind of standing waves? The, do the nodes move? The nodes don't really move, and we'll, we'll see it. Well, they don't really move because this guy's sitting. Right. Yeah. Right. This guy's sitting. So what we see then in California, because of that train, we have a change in the storm tracks and we have a change in the <coughs> precipitation. So December, even though December was close to normal, okay, so this is October, December is still, we were dry, okay, and then the storms came in January, okay. So what we do is now we have the models to predict. We have the coupled model. And so we do the pro projection. And so what we do is, is in the, it's a pseudo initial condition. So we have um, observations in the ocean, okay, and observations in the atmosphere. And so we project several months forward. I'm waiting for a hand. If we can't predict the weather for five days or two weeks, how can I project three months? You're projecting an average. Yeah, yeah. So what we're doing is the climate issue. So what we do is we're looking at not what would happen on February 15th or some particular day. We're saying what is the probability? So we do an ensemble. So we predict instead of one initial condition, we perturb the initial condition, and then we do 50. Okay, we do 50 projections. Okay, each one is deterministic, but then you can, add from 50 projections, you can see the projection, the probability that this is warmer and this is cooler. Okay, the probability that this is drier and this is, this is wet. Okay, so this is a probabilistic statement, but these are 
is a, a, a 60% wetter probability that this February is wetter than typical February. Mm. Okay. So you can see immediately the problem with your Olympics. Okay, it's what happened. Okay, so there's the El Nino, and you remember the orange juice problems in Miami and cold and Atlanta. Okay, so here we have we have the El Nino. Okay, it's a fairly typical thing. So you can see here immediately if I come back to the to the train to the train here, then I have shifted the storm tracks. Okay, by, by putting in high pressure, low pressure, I'm shifting the storm tracks. So instead of instead of snowing in Vancouver, oops, wrong direction, side there. Uh, <laughs> so instead of snowing in the storm tracks going to Vancouver, now the storm tracks are going to here, okay, rather than there in Vancouver is cold. I'm sorry, what's the difference between these two sides? Left and right? hmm? Oh, sorry, this is precipitation probability, this is temperature probability. Uh, okay. Precipitation is tough to, to predict, okay, because temperature, you know, temperature is temperature, but to get pressure, the pressure just peels from our teeth when there's a messiness with water vapor. But then when I want wind, okay, it's a pressure gradient, so I'm doing the first derivative of pressure or first derivative of temperature. If I want precipitation, I need to calculate the convergence, which is the second derivative of temperature. Okay, I have much more confidence it's easier to do temperature than it is to do the second derivative. <laughs> I mean, not just the second derivative of temperature, then it's like this marvelous saturation curve, like the, right, it's the zero one thing, and I cross to the other side, I have condensation or vapor. So this is a, the, the, you, know, you know, precipitation is a tough thing to measure. But basically, we're trying to predict the second derivative. What sets the scale of the oscillations in pressure that you were showing, like big blob here, and then there's, you know, some these all these things have a size scale. Yeah. So the, the these scales. Okay. So let's go back to to the ocean. When I look at these, the scale is set by the if you have a perturbation. Here the scale is set by the Coriolis, the variation, the beta, the top, the BF, dy. So it's this the the variation of the Coriolis parameter with latitude. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you basically say, I have a vortex, right? I, I have to conserve absolute vorticity, and so when I go north, the planetary vorticity changes, and so the, the relative vorticity of the flow has to change to conserve absolute vorticity. So, so, so it, doesn't, it doesn't involve like the height of the atmosphere? Yes, all of those, yeah, but those are, those, the variations in those are minor. Okay. So it's about 10 kilometer scale height. Yes. It looks like that's like, the variation there is like, what, five, like, it was like 5,000 miles. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. But here, what we have is that the wind, so I said the Kelvin waves, and so those, uh, uh, they symmetric across the equator, and so then when they come over here, then there's the velocity wave from we don't see this in the Atlantic, even though the winds can do that because of the scale of the Atlantic. Okay, the Atlantic is this 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 size, okay, one third the size of the Pacific. It's, just, it's sort of like they, they bounce <laughs> into one another. Okay, so you don't get this coherence and sustained warm block. Okay, that could influence the atmosphere. So it just goes there and it, it gets washed out. Okay, yeah. Is there the, the two maps of the US that was your last slide? Um, okay. Can we draw a simple correspondence between these patterns and the, the nodes? The yeah, oh yeah. So this is where, unfortunately, this is, if you look at this, this is the Pacific North American pattern. So this is one block, the warm block is here, and the cold block is there. Okay. Right? So it's not, just, it's, it's not too simplistic to think about it that way. Yeah. No, 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 it, it is exactly how we think about okay. it. So we call that the PNA pattern, the Pacific North American pattern is you have warm and cold here. Yeah. So there were years, as you can see, when Alaska was warmer than Miami. Okay, so here you see the jet stream coming straight down like this. Okay? It just deflects the flow. And, and is this just reversed in the 
the east coast of this very So while it was very cold here, um, so let me just finish this. That the, the temperature, we look at, that was December, and so this is the average of 2009, and so 2009 right number two, the warmest year out of 130 years. Uh, even though that way everyone he talks about the snow in Washington, and so, okay, so I won't go into the moon. So this is, a, could be a tie, but anyway, so it's, it's not, it's, it's warm. What am I saying? It's warm. Okay, so it is, it is warm out there. Okay, so this is the temperature, the global temperature record, uh, the thermometer record, and so it hasn't come back down to here. So what is also very interesting, if I come back to here, is that because it's the Arctic Oscillation, the mass shifting, it's very cold here and it's very warm up there. Okay? And so what we also see is that the sea ice, and this is, I emphasize, this is not summer sea ice, this is December sea ice. Okay, December sea ice, we were number four, I think, uh, the fourth, fourth lowest since the beginning of the satellite. Okay. So what I'm trying to do here is to describe to you, you know, the, the, the climate, you know, when we look at climate, it's not just slowly warming, but the dynamics of the warming, the season to season. And a very interesting question that we are working on, but we do not have an answer for, is that these you know, the Arctic Oscillation and the El Nino is a perturbation on some basic flow, okay? When the basic flow is changing, because the climate is changing, then we do not know, you know, whether the El Nino should get stronger or weaker, the El Nino should be more frequent or less frequent, the Arctic, you know, what would happen to all of those? And this is a really interesting problem that we're working on. All we can say is that when it is warmer, we expect more severe weather. Okay? The, the one part I can tell you that I can, I can explain is that the rainfall intensity has increased. I don't know if you guys have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> when it rains, it rains. Okay? It is a long, dry period. Right? All you have to do is to say, class is temporal. Right? When it's warmer, the atmosphere can hold more vapor. So when it condenses, there's more. <laughs> there is more, okay? But then there are long, long dry periods in the middle, okay? That we're trying to understand the changes in the probability density function, the PDF, you know, the frequency. You know, it's not that it was never that precipitation was never Gaussian, but but we're seeing the increase in the extreme part of the precipitation, changes in the intensity of rainfall, the frequency of rainfall, etc. Okay, so those are the questions that we're working on. Uh, the changes in climate, yes, you know, I'm not going to talk about it, you know, but the changes in the background in the, as a fluid dynamics problem, which is what I'm interested in, when I change the background, how will the perturbations change? Okay? And then, in a sense, what we feel is the perturbation, not the slow background. So, this is the end. So this is February, snowing in the wrong places. <laughs> okay, there's too much snow in the area, <coughs> and the helicoptering snow uh, to the Olympics. Okay, so I'll stop here. So, see if you have questions. Yeah. So if this, I think you explained, was the result of the El Nino pattern. Yeah, this is the El Nino. Right. So and I mean, this is a combination of right. the El Nino and the Arctic. So, but the El Nino, it sounds like we have a Yes, um, because of, because we've got 20 years of observation, right. and we knew what to observe. So I'm feeling like we couldn't have been surprised, could they? <laughs> not for not two years or whenever they had to compete to be the city. Because we just don't know when on the coming. We, we did not kind of have action. the skill to predict. Okay, so a friend of mine was the one who put the moorings because I kept saying the El Nino. Not only do I need to do the atmosphere, I need to know the waves that are probably going to happen for. So what he did was he put in, and this is a very interesting instrumental problem, he put in what we call moorings. So you sink some block of concrete, 
okay, to the bottom. And so you have a long wire, and this is the trick type of boom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so then you can measure temperature salinity along it. But a lot of people have failed. So to make the because the currents come and they push, so to make it stable, he made the the cable four meters shorter. Okay, so it's always taut. And then when they lower this over, they put in ferrets, you know, like little wind socks. Okay, so that when the currents come from a certain direction, they would line up, so they reduce turbulence. Okay, so then, so <coughs> then you have the stable, stable structure, and you can mount temperature salinity sensors. And, you know. So, so a crucial part of the observation. The predictive skill is that we know what the what the upper thousand meters, you know, what 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 the waves are doing underneath. Okay, the thermal <coughs> without that we don't know. So what we're struggling with is with the Arctic oscillation. If it is the stratosphere, you know, how do we maintain an observation? So we really lack in the observation to do this. And it's really, you know, like it's nice to be a statistician. <laughs> you do it of all without the new oscillations. Yeah. What correlations do you get between the Arctic oscillations and the Albina Um so far they have they have done, you know, they it, it didn't show very well. I should have shown you the low pass um, time series here. Okay, so the Arctic oscillation is really there on a much more, on a much longer time scale. So when we go to the question, one of the questions we have here, for example, the 98, uh, the 98 El Nino, so this was also that they came here, so, so before, now we call the Arctic oscillation. When we first found the oscillation, it was the North Atlantic oscillation, and then we found the Pacific Decadal oscillation, <laughs> okay. and then we found the Southern. You know, so so now we try. So now the, the analysis is merging, harmonizing all of that. The Decadal oscillation is interesting because they found a Decadal oscillation in salmon, okay, because of the or because of the, the the temperature oscillation, the wind and temperature oscillation. And so when the when Alaska, Canada, Washington, Oregon were having salmon negotiations, okay, it's sort of like there is an oscillation. So how do you take that into account? You know, between who's catching who's catching more, who's catching less. But now we we look at this and say, you know, the, when the, when when the decadal, you know, I think about it as different time scales. So the the the, the AO, the Arctic oscillation is. Not on a longer time scale. So we try to understand if this, the, the, the really strong El Ninos were related to a strong phase, okay, okay. The, the background, you know, the, 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 the basic state for the perturbation changed because of the Arctic, uh, uh, Arctic oscillation. And this is one of the challenges that we have with all of these, is that we know the short time scale, so we know a little bit more about the El Nino, Time scale, and then we know a little bit more about the Arctic oscillation, and now we're opening ourselves up to one of the multi-decadal oscillations, mm -hmm. and the, and there are not enough observations for the multi-decadal oscillation. So we're really um, struggling to say how do we, how do we, what are the measurements? Where is the mm -hmm. action more specific? So you're not saying for presence, not we don't have enough data to get presence. We do not have. You know, so they use statistical techniques to, to look at shorter time series, uh, but but not the, not the classical way. Okay, they use for six cycles. <laughs> so if I want a 60-year cycle, I need 360 years of data. It's too late. <laughs> and other questions? Well, thank you very much.